a board member of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. Happy to be with you today. And we're here at the National Women's History Alliance awardees of 19, uh, 2019 Women of Achievement. We have a great show for you today. Welcome back. And I have Kimberly here with me this afternoon, and she's part of the board for the American. I'm the Executive Vice President of the National Women's History Alliance and have been with Molly since early 2000s when we were doing the suffrage parades in August in Sacramento. In California, yes. I was California now president and then met Molly and so we've done many things together over the years. You never retire here so she brought me right over to her group. Right. And we've been in transition. As you know, we need to get younger people involved. We need to learn the new modern way to tell the history so that people know it's out there and needs to be learned. Um, so we do these events for two reasons. One, because so many women, and even today we've got a couple that we're honoring that are no longer with us. So we need to, we certainly need to honor the women who, who have come before us. We need to honor the women doing the work now. And we need to make sure that women understand the work needs to continue. So it's not a stat, a, it's not, it doesn't stay in one place. It's continuous and we, people came before us, people are coming after us. We're really excited. We're trying to build on our new name, on our new connections, because next year with the centennial and 2020, we're planning big suffrage. Is In fact, I will be announcing the theme at the end of the luncheon today and the date of next year's luncheon so that people can get on their calendar and get going because there's just so much more to do. And there's so many people out there that are interested and want to do it. We just need to find a way to transition to the younger people and to the new way of doing things so that they can take it from us. I know we've been trying to up, up, up our game in terms of social media and all that. That's been a challenge, frankly. It certainly is for me. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. But we're smart, but again, it's just a whole new way of doing things yes. in many cases. Um, the other thing I want uh, to mention, I know that Molly and Bob Cooney also sit on the national board of National Boats for Women Trail, yes. and California has been a, a significant role model in that as right. well. Um, are you also having some of the Pomeroy markers in California for some we, of the sites? We have been talking about it. I'm also on the California 2020 Suffrage Project. Oh, okay. So we've we've done the suffrage at the. Uh, suffrage grave sites, uh -huh. and so we're, we're trying to get more and more. I've been talking women's history for years because it's a passion of mine, and I'm always telling people, I know there's a lot of women's history in the East. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know it's there, you hear about it, the Susan B. and the Elizabeth Kate Stanton and Rochester and all of that, right? but there's stuff in California too. Mm -hmm. We just have to find our little hidden spaces right. and, and get it out there so people understand. You have to go to somebody's attic country. or your basement to find all the letters. Well, and, and we had to vote before y'all had it back here, so... <laughs> We've been doing our stuff. That's right. Was it you and Wyoming that started? That were the no, first? we were the sixth state. We were sixth. 1911. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who were the earlier ones? Do you remember? Wyoming. Washington got it the year before we did, so they got it in 1910. Oregon got it the year after we did in 1912. Um, Colorado got it early. I want to say Idaho got it early. It's very interesting that that part of the country, but women were doing... Do you know why? Well, because... Well, you tell me why. I believe the yes. reason women got the vote in the West was because you got representation in Congress by the amount of people that voted. So the Western states who were so far away, and in those days, tra you know, what travel was like. Right. So they needed the numbers. It's not because men wanted to give us the vote or wanted to oh, hear well, our sure opinion. Not. Right. <laughs> oh, sure. It's not. because they wanted representation, and so California was a big state. If you could get all those people registered to vote. You got that many more men in Congress. That's why we got the vote, I think. And that part of it I had heard too that frankly, because of the trip across the country, where there were a lot of single parents and moms, that they had their own lobby, kind of for themselves. And yes. they were independent women owners, farmers, mm -hmm. um, and so they were part of the strength of the community, and so they kind of snuck it in. Right. Which and in the state of Washington, which is interesting, they won and lost the vote three times because they gave it to them for school boards. And then didn't like who they elected, took it away from them. Sure. They gave it back to them because they had someone they wanted to run in their some of the city councils. Mm -hmm. So the men thought they could control their wives and give them the vote a certain way. Right. And when they didn't, they took it away from them. So when the Washington <laughs> woman finally wrote that final one that passed in 1910, mm -hmm. it's because there was no loopholes. We get the vote this time, we got the vote. Right. <laughs> so they did. Um, 
What happens, I've heard you say that you're doing a suffrage theme probably for mm -hmm. next year. Yes. How can um, other states, if they haven't already, get involved in this process nationally? One of the best national t tools is Vision 2020, run right out of Drexel University. It's one of the best ones. And so a lot of people are kind of jumping into their resources, if you will. And we're trying to get more and more, more people involved. Cal everything we do in California will be put up on a website. People have access to it so they can replicate it in their own communities. So we're all trying to be and very... And that's it's one of the national posts yes. on the trail as well. Yes. So that, that information is everywhere. Yes. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. You're very welcome. Have a special event like it always is. Thank you and very much. we'll be seeing you in the suffrage trail. Yes, you will. Thank, thank you. you. Our next honoree is Kathy Kelly, one of the nation's leading peace activists who has made pacifism her life's work. She uses a variety of nonviolent civil dis disobedience methods in her work and has been arrested more than 60 times. <laughs> That's probably a really low number for reality. Um, during, uh, between the two Gulf Wars, she traveled to Iraq uh, 27 times or so, delivering medicine and food in violation of U.S. sanctions. Um, and she, she's truly made it her, her discipline. Um, now our board member, Carol, Carolyn Peth, will present Ms. Kelly with her award. It's just been a wonderful honor to meet you sit with you and visit with you and especially to honor you with this award from the National Women's History Alliance for being a woman of vision, a champion of peace and nonviolence. Thank you so much. Well, to the National Women's History Alliance, to the board, to the staff, I want to express my deep thanks and also to every person who's preceded me in speaking. It's been very good to hear from each of you. I hope you'll indulge me in a, a memory of a somewhat unusual mentor in my life. I had decided to be part of a group planting corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites. I don't know why I don't go out and do it more often, but maybe not to plant corn now. And um, as it happened, um, I was kneeling and handcuffed with a soldier behind me who had his gun aimed at me because he had come to arrest me. And um, I probably lasted about a minute and a half in silence. And then I just started talking to him. I didn't turn around and look at him, but I told him why we had done what we'd done. And, and then I asked him, do you think the corn will grow? <laughs> and he said, I don't know, ma'am, but I sure hope so. <laughs> So I said, uh, would you like to say a prayer? Yes, ma'am. So I quickly said the St. Francis Peace Prayer, and he said, Amen. And then he asked me, ma'am, would you like a drink of water? And I said, oh, yes, please. And then he said, ma'am, please tip your head back. I can still feel that water dribbling down my chin. And I think that soldier took a risk to do an act of kindness for a complete stranger. But I want to ask you today to just stay with his question a little bit longer. He asked me, ma'am, would you like a drink of water? He's supposed to be protecting that nuclear weapon. His job is to be guarding the nuclear weapon. And in order to give ma'am a drink of water, I know I saw both his hands on the canteen. So I don't know what he did with the gun or how he but if we could take that question, would you like a drink of water? And express that to children in Yemen today, facing cholera, children facing starvation and disease driven by war. We could say we care more about you than we care about the weapons. Well, put the weapons aside. Would you like a drink of water? Or come closer. Let's go to Flint, Michigan. For children getting lead poisoned water, they're being poisoned by their own water. If we could ask them, would you like clean water? We care about that more than we'll ever care about the weapons. Or go to the children of future generations, children unborn as yet, and say to them, it's more important to us that you get water, that you get your needs met, than that we preserve our capacity to wage war and be a menacing force on Earth. These are, in a sense, questions we can so easily understand. Barbara Deming once wrote, Locked in winter, summer lies. 
gather your bones together, rise. And so I know we will all, in our deepest down desires, want to rise, rise together to build a better world where security is never, never, never national security, but human security. Thank you. Our final honoree is Graciela Sanchez, a dedicated neighborhood activist and culture wor cultural worker. As director of the Esperanza Center for Peace and Justice, she has worked to bring peace through community organizing, building relationships across difference and inter intersectionality. And now our board member, Pat Pierce, will present Ms. Sanchez with her award. For the National Women's History Alliance, I am so proud to present this award to Graciela Sanchez for being a visionary champion of peace and nonviolence and a 2019 awardee. Congratulations. Si se calla el cantón, calla la vida, porque la vida. La vida misma es todo un canto. Si se calla el cantor, muere el espanto. La luz, la alegría y la esperanza. Thank you for this recognition of my work and the work of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. And thank you for carrying on the great work of the National Women's History Alliance bringing the stories of our mothers and our grandmothers into popular education. I am grateful for the wise guidance of my dark-skinned mother Isabel and my abuelitas Panchita and Teresita who taught me to be loving, respectful, giving, honest, and caring to all those around me. I, am honor, I honor them and the thousands of other mujeres I have met, worked, and strategized with listen to and learn from throughout my lifetime. As women of color, we are the survivors of physical and cultural genocide. The conquest has left us empty. Los de poder nos hacen invisible, invisible, even to ourselves. To defeat us, to take our land, our language, to exploit and control us, they make us the ugly, the stupid, the lazy, the dangerous, and violent. We are their greatest fear. And yet, we survive. We survive because we must. To teach our children, to care for our families, to support our comadres, to find hope in another day. I was born and raised in the west side of San Antonio. My family has lived in that barrio for over a hundred years. My mother has lived in the same one block area for all but two of her 95 years. The west side was the Mexican side of town during segregation times, and it remains about 96% Mexican American. It is the poorest community in San Antonio and among the poorest in this nation. And historically, it is known as the capital of Mexican America. After college, I returned to San Antonio and searched for people who wanted to change the very violent and hateful culture that exists in San Antonio, this nation, and the world. Why did the only reasonable, well-paid jobs available to Latino and black workers involve working for one of the city's five military bases? Why were our elected officials and leaders of nonprofits silent about the wars in Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, and about apartheid in South Africa, or the fact that many of these uh, bases also taught, trained the torture skills of all the, the, the torture taking place throughout the world? Why did our government consistently serve the interests of the rich who exploited our people and poison our environment while ignoring the desperate needs of our gente? Soon, a small group of fierce women came together. In 1985, we coordinated San Antonio's first International Women's Day March and Rally, and we began to dream together. We dreamed of a space that centered women and girls, where everyone has civil rights and economic justice, where the environment is cared for, 
where cultures are honored and communities are safe. And as we work towards this dream, we began to understand the lasting wounds of physical and cultural genocide that plague our communities. We began to understand that for us, for the survivors, empowerment of our communities require that we become culturally grounded, that we learn about our family and community history, and that we consciously honor the values and practices of our elders, that we work to restore connection among individuals and families, to re-educate ourselves and our young people, and to nurture healthy lives. We do this through programming that speaks to our communities, that, deal, that builds deep bonds of solidarity locally and internationally, that creates and builds a community of justice, compassion, cariño, respeto, convivencia, y paz. We challenge ourselves to be queer and Latina, be Latina and feministas, be feministas and anti-racist, be anti-racist and pro-worker, be pro-worker and anti-imperialist, be anti-imperialist and pro-environment. Yet, as we build a community de alma, we are attacked. We are threatened from every direction. We have struggled with allies as men sought to divide us, mujeres warned the women to move away from the dikes. We have been attacked as well by those who benefit from the violent culture. Our, our offices were broken into, our computers stolen, our equipment destroyed, our windows also broken, and our lives threatened. Human feces smeared on bras and hung over our cars and door entries. Ay de mi llorona, llorona de ayer y hoy. Ay de mi llorona, llorona de ayer y hoy. We have learned that our survival depends on recovering ourselves. We have to know who we are. We have to respect ourselves, our families, our communities, our culture, our gente, and your gente, your people. We search for the remnants, for the stories, images, and music. We talk with las sabias, the elders, the wise women. But being mujeres, they are afraid. They can't believe that anyone would be interested in their stories. So they tell the story of their husbands, of their children, of their male children, of their brothers and fathers who fought in wars. And we say, those are interesting and important, but what about your story? and your mom's story, and your sister's, and your daughter's stories. So we said, bring a picture of yourself, and talk about the picture. And slowly but steadily, they have spoken about themselves as little girls, as teenagers goofing around, dancing. These working class and poor brown women are seeing themselves positively portrayed, seeing themselves pretty and sassy and charming and dignified and happy, y con orgullo, with pride. And they tell you about the curanderas, the healers, and the plantas medicinales, and the fruit trees, and the gallinas, the street vendors, and the pecan shellers who march with Emma Tenayuca and Manuela Solis Sager, 10,000 women strong. And the stories, the stories open a way back to community, back to each other, away from TV, computer games, away from materialism and individualism, away from war and violence and hate and destruction. And asking each other to claim the values taught to us by our abuelitas, of being buena gente, good people, of being honest and truthful, of taking care of one another, of respecting the elders, be they human, buildings, or trees, of sharing our limited resources so that we all benefit, not just the few. With their stories, young and old people are building self-confidence, power, knowledge, teaching each other the history that has never been taught in our schools. And in doing so, they are honoring their lives and their communities and becoming connected to a history of strong, brilliant, hardworking, passionate, honorable, and humble people. They are reclaiming the women's stories, the working class and working poor people's history. And so the work continues. The work has to be a lifetime commitment. The work we must do 
must be with a habit of self-examination and a commitment to peace, justice, and nonviolence. The work we do must include a process which nurtures lasting friendships within a community of shared almas. Comunidad de alma, shared values, comunidad de alma, a community of soul, a community of hearts. The work we do must be courageous, understanding that we will feel alone and we will be attacked, but knowing that we are part of a global quest for peace and for justice. Knowing that our movement grows and that our values and our dreams and are successfully changing the hate, the violence, and the greed. Si se calla el cantor, calla la vida. Muchas gracias. We have one final honoree that we want to recognize who is Peace Pilgrim again. We actually have a couple folks from her foundation that were able to join us today. So Martha Wheelock uh, from the National Women's History Alliance Board is presenting them in her name. Hi, thank you for joining us today. And I think it's really appropriate to leave you with this message that we all must be able to walk 25,000 and more for years for peace. And I'd love to introduce you to Bruce Nichols, whose group, the Friends of the Peace Pilgrim, continue her work. Let us all continue the work of peace. Thank you, Bruce, for continuing. Welcome back. And I'm happy to be interviewing Sue Klein and known her for many years and her work with the feminist majority in the clearinghouse. So tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing with those organizations. Well, um, I'm now the co-president of the Clearinghouse on Women's Issues, mm -hmm. and we're really happy that you all, with Maryland Women's Heritage Center, did I get the name yes, perfectly absolutely. right? Yes, absolutely. Are a member of the Clearinghouse on Women's Issues, and I'm also the Education Equity Director at the Feminist Majority. And you've had that position for some time, haven't you? Yes, since 2003 when I retired from the U.S. Department of Education. And that's where we first met, I think, when we were doing work with Linda Chavez and with NICE right. and Agile as a player became. So when you worked for the Department of Ed, uh, what was your function there? I was working in the area of research, and whenever I could, I worked on gender equity research. Yes. Some and of the early research, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We put together the first handbook for achieving what we called then sex equity mm -hmm. in education. Mm -hmm. And now it's uh, more generally referred to as gender equity in education. So our first handbook came out in 1985. And our second handbook I developed when I retired from the U.S. Department of Education and joined the Feminist Majority Foundation. And it was published um, in 2007, and we changed the name. It was called the Handbook for Achieving Gender Equity Through Education. I know that resource was used across the country by, at that time, um, the Federal Perkins Regulation was funding sex equity coordinators, and again, that gave them such a useful handbook because many of them came in maybe with an is interest in feminism or equity, but didn't necessarily know how to adapt it in terms of an education context. So that was a terrific resource that, that other things were built upon. And we even had chapters in both handbooks related to the first one was vocational work, right. and the second one was career and technical education, as the names change, it's right. interesting to see right. that through the And there was years. a lot of effort too, I know, getting women into higher wage occupations, non-traditional careers, and, and those pathways that were leading the future. But you could, I know a lot of that was the precursor to some of the STEM things as well. Right, and they're having their big uh, conference uh, next week, and Mimi Lufkin oh. has been their long-time head. Uh -huh. Uh -huh has just retired and uh, now 
man is taking herbal rights. He's, he's a researcher, I think, isn't he? Wasn't he? But he's worked, with, he's worked with them a long time. And um, we had worked with um, Claudia Morrell, who did a lot of work mm -hmm. yeah. with... Um, Where is she now? I'm not sure, but she lives in Maryland, so that's why I know her from Maryland, but I'm not sure. So she was working with us. And I was hoping to see Linda Shepherds today. Isn't she? She's not feeling well. So, um, but we're just, there's lots of people here today, uh, other people from the Clearinghouse, in addition to you and, and Loretto, and um, we're, I'm a, we're a member, but it's difficult to get into town a lot of times for your meetings. But talk about some of the last um, themes of your meetings that you've had recently. I've seen them, they look really fabulous speakers, so can we share a little bit about that? Our last meeting was really wonderful. Yes helping women write themselves into history because a lot of the women who come to our clearinghouse meetings have contributed a great deal to feminist activism and research in many, many areas. For many years, too. Yeah, for many years. And so we had uh, Tina Hobson, who's our former board member, who talked about how she was trying to figure out where to put some of the most valuable archival documents she has. She was the first director of the Federal Women's Program. Oh, really? In the federal government in the Civil Service Commission. And so she has documents where they collected information and all the women in various agencies, including the White House at that time. And uh, we also, uh, are, uh, can, uh, she invited uh, another speaker, Elsa Little, who's a specialist on helping women document their own history. Uh, and she uh, told us about different resources we could use, how a lot of the historical family tree organizations, uh, especially the huge one that was developed by the Mormons, um, have now uh, developed a uh, website so that you can input videos and all kinds oh, of other information into your own family tree. And I'm thinking about getting my 102-year-old stepmom uh, and her children to put that information into a family tree. So th there's so many resources you have, but thank you so much for talking to us today and enjoy the event. Well, you're a wonderful interviewer, and uh, you should volunteer when you have any spare time to interview for the Veteran Feminists of America, because that's basically what they do. They're telling their stories. Great, yep. great. Thanks again, Thank Sue.